Greetings respective viewers, I'm George from Ireland. Here I am at number two Gower Street, London, and behind me is the house where uh, Millicent Fawcett lived for much of her adult life. So uh, she wasn't born here, she's born um, somewhere in the Midlands if, if memory serves, but she came to London as a child. She went to a school on Blackheath, which is um, just, just south of, of the city centre. Back then it would have been considered really outside London. Anyhow, um, so she came from a uh, middle class family. They were communicants of the Church of England. Of course, in the 19th century, that mattered which religious denomination you were. And uh, she was born at a time when uh, even most men didn't um, have the right uh, to vote, though that was changing. The United Kingdom was gradually democratizing, and by the 1880s, even the Conservative Party said that it agreed with democracy. The Liberals had said that a little bit earlier. Um, so she had several siblings, and um, her el elder, elder sister, eldest sister, Elizabeth was the first woman to qualify as a medical doctor in the United Kingdom and very few countries in the world. I think maybe the United States had allowed some women to qualify as doctors prior to that. They're often called doctresses um, to begin with. Um, so uh, her elder sister Elizabeth was a, was a stellar intellectual, had to be largely self-taught in sciences. Bedford College for Women on Bedford Square, which is very close, that uh, had opened not long beforehand. Um, and it was the first uh, third level uh, place of education for women in the United Kingdom. The United States had a few colleges for women since the, since the um, uh, 1830s. So the UK is the second country in the world to allow that. Um, and uh, it was very close to Bedford Square, where, um, where it was. It's there, um, not exactly there, but that's the square. I'm not showing you the exact location, the original college for women. Anyway, so um, her sister Elizabeth had a boyfriend uh, who was a Mr. Fawcett, who was a, a liberal aspiring politician. And then, um, you know, a woman couldn't possibly have a professional career and be married. And even um, a woman who was a teacher, if she got married, she's often expected to resign because she had to look after her husband and children. Of course, having several children those days. Moreover, there were no labor saving devices. You know, remember this before the refrigerator, the freezer, the microwave. The, um, the, the gas oven, I can't think what else, the washing machine, the dishwasher, the vacuum cleaner. So um, uh, housework was far more labor intensive and time consuming. And because you know you couldn't freeze food, you had to go to the, you know, the shop and buy fresh food every day for many um, comestibles, because it wouldn't keep. And even an upper class one with servants was supposed to be supervising them. Um, Anyway, so working class women, even though married had children, usually had to work because their income was just so low. Even that meant that housework and even childcare was relatively neglected. And that was, that was the majority of people. But uh, anyway, so uh, as Elizabeth went, went off to pursue her medical studies here, faced all sorts of obstacles and the, the male medical students voting that she shouldn't be allowed in. Um, and uh, the, then the medical authorities here realizing there was no rule specifically disbarring a female from uh, studying medicine. So she was allowed in and then Elizabeth, no, no hospital in the United Kingdom would allow her to be a junior or house officer, as in that's the first stage in your career. But she did find a hospital in Paris would allow her to do that. So she moved to France and did that and later came back. And that was that. And then after this, the rules were tightened, whereas the British Medical Association specifically forbade women from qualifying as doctors. But that was eventually, that was got rid of not too long afterwards. And indeed, there's, a, there's a Elizabeth Garrett Anderson Hospital named after this woman's sister. But back to Millicent. So um, she married uh, the man who had been her elder sister's boyfriend. Might seem faintly wrong to people today. He was 14 years older than each other, but um, they're very much in sympathy and that their views seem to chime on every conceivable issue. So he was a Liberal MP for Brighton. And so she was traveling down to Brighton and even did addressing political rallies with him, which was highly contentious behavior at the time. Your woman should be seen and not heard. Ooh, and I just saw a young doctor I know cycling past. Hi, Benji. Um, but anyway, uh, because you know, they, they look back to what the Bible said, that um, the female voice is nakedness. I remember to the late 18th century, women weren't even allowed to perform in the theater, or they weren't allowed to sing in the presence of men. Men could sing in the presence of women, or indeed the presence of men, the presence of mixed sex audiences, but women could only perform to women because it was just simply unbecoming. It was not fitting for a lady to do this. A theater had a whiff of the not quite respectable. It was, you know, an, a, an actress was seen as little better than a prostitute. So yes, they're very popular in the 19th century, but still there was a question mark over their morality. But speaking to a political rally was, was very unladylike, but she did it anyway. So she was a bit of a, mm, how would I put it, like a, a trendsetter, or someone who pushed back the boundaries of acceptable behavior. So she was quite daring. Um, 
And from uh, really her teenage years, she believed women ought to have the right to vote, and she was not original in this. Other people had, had believed that. She knew John Stuart Mill, the uh, um, philosopher, the Liberal MP, and he'd advocated for that, the second person ever in the House of Commons to call for, uh, for women's suffrage. And, and people thought the idea was, was risible. They didn't even need to argue against it. To many people, it appeared to be self-evidently ridiculous. Um, and no country in the world had ever allowed this. Well, that's actually not true, and even this country had allowed it. But that was the argument that advanced, and women are physically weak and they're overly emotional and you know all government rests on, um, on on physical force ultimately and men are called to fight and women can't fight we obviously now know that women can fight and on and on and all these spurious uh, medical uh, arguments were advanced to say that um, women couldn't take it in a woman the body controls the mind in a man the mind controls the body that was the the um, uh, argument they attempted to advance saying women are controlled by menstruation and parturition and menopause and blah 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 and uh, you know the, the heightened emotional state of a woman in politics might cause her to have a miscarriage and whatnot, and she would neglect her husband and her wains. Um, but anyway, she campaigned ceaselessly for um, her cause, disseminating these ideas, helping form the Kensington Society in 1865, a women's discussion group. And if you look back to the 18th century, uh, there was a craze for debating in this country. It became very fashionable, um, discussing all sort of controversial topics. Um, men as well as women, usually separately, sometimes all female debating societies, one of them called the Female Parliament um, here. By the late 19th century, that was not as much en vogue as it had been, but uh, she obviously pr produced pamphlets and went around uh, tireless tirelessly evangelizing for the cause of female suffrage. Suffrage being suffered as in allowed to vote. And saying, but um, you know, some women are more highly educated than men. She was, for example. And if women um, are less educated than men on the whole, that's simply because they're disbarred from educational opportunities, and people are prejudiced, and prejudiced against them. It's not that they lack the uh, intellectual aptitude, or indeed the endeavour for such things. Citing what uh, Mary Wollstonecraft had, had published in um, the 1790s, in, in a vindication of the right of woman that. Um, uh, women are simply denied educational opportunities and their condition, they're led to believe that they're less clever, so that makes them spend less effort on it and they're told, don't be too bookish because boys won't like you. Nobody want to marry you if you're a blue stocking. And really it's a blue stocking society for intellectual women. Um, but uh, by the 1890s, this was, was gaining a bit of traction. She had, so she had been a liberal like her husband and over the Irish Home Rule uh, issue, she split, became a liberal unionist, liking Joseph Chamberlain, um, and that was that. But uh, she helped found the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, which is really a society of societies. There are many groups for it, as in some of them were Labour women, Liberal women, Conservative women, women of various religious denominations and so forth. Um, so it had many subsections within it. So she wanted the broadest possible church. The rival organisation was the Women's Social and Political Union, which is led by the Pankhurst family. So Millicent Fawcett, she found um, Emmeline Pankhurst, the matriarch of the Pankhursts, rather hard work and felt this woman was a bit of a termagant, just kind of what her, her, her um, enemies, the anti-suffragists, accused her of being and rather dictatorial. So Millicent Fawcett saying, you know, we mustn't um, swap the rule of, of, of woman by man for the rule of woman by woman. It's ruled by four people, Emmeline Pankhurst and three of her daughters, and eventually just by one, Emmeline Pankhurst, who even banished one of her daughters to Australia. Mon Dieu, a fate's worse than death. Um, anyway, so in the run-up to the First World War, this was an issue that simply wouldn't go away. It's part of the, part of the um, uh, Edwardian crisis, as they call it. Um, and so the Labour Party broadly agreed, and the Liberal Party found it more problematic, and the Conservative Party broadly agreed but on which precise model. Should it be women only of a certain age, a higher property edge qualification, or what? Should women be permitted to vote but not to become MPs? Uh, they, they weren't quite clear. Absolute equality didn't appear to be realistic at the time. Not many people were willing to concede that, but votes for some women. Remember, from the 1880s, women had the right to vote in local elections, as in for their county council, their city council, but not for national elections, not elect people to Westminster. And it had been proved that, that female suffrage could work. You look at several states of the United States, several Scandinavian countries, and in New Zealand, by the First World War, they'd all granted women the right to vote, and women had indeed been elected to some legislatures in other countries pointed out that in the French Revolution, France briefly gave women the right to vote. Or even in this country, there were women in the House of Lords in the Middle Ages, abbesses. Or in the 16th century, a handful of women had the right to vote for elections in the House of Commons because they owned substantial real property. So this, these things were not unprecedented. Um, they were not revolutionary, as, as some pretended. 
And now she was a moderate within the movement, but relied on moral force, not physical force, not the WSPU. The rival movement was trying to kill anyone, but they were, they were committing acts of vandalism. They were um, giving sent to prison, refusing to pay fines so that they would go to prison. They wanted to be incarcerated, refusing to eat, hunger strike and all the rest of it. And did this help? Did it, did it set them back? It's, it's, it's questionable saying, oh, look at these Harridans, they're deranged. It's a sort of psychiatric disorder, wanting women to have the right to vote. And the worst sort of termagant would want this. So we shouldn't be giving in to these, um, well, what would I say, these viragos. Um, that's how their opponents would say. It was even a women's league for opposing female suffrage led by Mrs. Humphrey Barclay. Why Mrs. Humphrey? Isn't that a boy's name? But a married woman in those days, if her husband was still alive, was supposed to be known by her husband's Christian name. Uh, if her husband died, she'd be known by her own Christian name. Say, so what? You don't even have your own personal name. I say Christian name, that's first name if you're American. These days, increasingly, we say first name. It seems a bit ridiculous. In the old days, we assumed everyone in this, in this country was a Christian. Um, because the names came from the Bible, the names from names of saints. But, you know, it would be ludicrous to say, what's your Christian name? The person says Abdullah, because lots of people are Muslims, Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, atheists, and so on. So we have to say first name, or indeed personal name. Uh, but anyway, when the, the First World War came out, she was in a bit of a bind. Um, she wasn't a pacifist. She had her doubts about this war. She'd been sent to South Africa during the, the Second South African War, 1899 to 1902, to, to um, examine the conditions of the Afrikaner civilians, that's the people of white Dutch descent, when they were in, interned in, in various concentration camps. Nothing like the concentration camps of, of, the, of the Third Reich. The reason the Third Reich used the word concentration camp is it's relatively innocuous. Not a single person was killed in these South African concentration camps. Some people died, but of illnesses. They weren't shot, they weren't gassed, they weren't forced to work, work or anything like that. But um, conditions were inadequate. Um, the supplies didn't always get through. I mean, not to the British Army, not to the people in the concentration camps, because trains were being blown up all the time. It was a war that was on, and they were living in tents. But sometimes they weren't even supplied with soap. But also, they're very diffuse population, suddenly brought together. They've been in remote farming communities, and suddenly you're at a camp with tens of thousands of people. So you don't have much of an immune system, and people um, were susceptible to various illnesses, particularly in their debilitated state, since they were undernourished. So. Um, Tens of thousands of these internees died. Some of them were, were black people who had been working as servants for the, the Boer families. Anyway, so Millicent Fawcett had reported on this, um, and so she was not keen on war. She didn't actually oppose it. Was the WSPU threw itself wholeheartedly into the war effort, um, donating all its funds to the war effort, and renaming its, 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 its um, uh, magazine, uh, The Women's Dreadnought, um, or having another magazine called Britannia, and being ferociously Germanophobic. Uh, well, she wasn't quite like that. But one thing with WSPU is um, it made some people reconsider saying, well, they are responsible citizens. Their patriotism should be rewarded with the right to vote. That worked for the Pankhursts. Um, also, for people who'd opposed women's suffrage, they were starting to see that the writing was on the wall. It made it less humiliating, a come down to say, okay, I changed my mind. Say, well, it's because of their um, fervent pro-war advocacy that uh, I, I realized um, I was mistaken. But anyway, we all know that the Representation of the People Act was passed in April 1918, before the First World War was over, granting women the right to vote, but not on an equal footing, only the age of, of uh, 30, and only if either on the local government register or married to a man who was. The local government register was for those who were householders, as in you own the house or the flat, or did you pay the rent? So that was a local government register. And that, that system in Britain, Great Britain prevailed till 1948. Only after that did it virtually all adults have the right to vote in local government, as indeed in national government. So that was her. She died in 1929, um, and uh, she was voted the greatest woman, I think, in, in, in British history recently, as a Fawcett Society, which is dedicated to the furtherance of uh, women's causes in politics and uh, supporting uh, females in politics and so forth. There's, a, there's even a Millicent Fawcett Hall in Westminster, but it's used by Westminster School as a theatre these days. You can see the statue of her on, on Parliament Square that was unveiled by Prime Minister Theresa May only last year. Uh, with bear it with it, she's holding the statue figurine is holding a um, piece of paper with the, with a legend "Courage calls to courage everywhere," which is um, um, a dictum of hers that she she uttered in 1920 at a memorial service for Emily Wilding Davis. You might know Emily Wilding Davis as the woman who was killed by the King's horse at the Epsom Derby in about uh, 1912. Uh, Emily Wilding Davis, was she trying to commit suicide or was she trying to simply stop the horse as part of a protest? Carrying her banner, shouting votes for women is questionable. And that may have again have been a disadvantage to the, to the movement because they say, oh look, they are mentally ill and 
they're vicious, these women are committing suicide, we can't possibly give in to these deranged extremists like that. Um, but that's uh, Emily Wilding Davis. Um, so Millicent uh, Fawcett, she died in, in um, 1929. She was cremated, so she got no grave. Uh, anything else I should want about to her? Yeah, I mean, her surname, um, Fawcett, I know in, in the United States we pronounce Fawcett. Obviously, in, in, in the United States it means something which turns on and off flowing water. We call that a tap in the British Isles. Well, that is enough a little bit about Millicent Fawcett, who was um, a very erudite woman, published several books on politi uh, political economy, for example, published biographies of great women, and was very much involved in um, uh, feminism as, as a worldwide movement and studied the movement in France, where it was um, considerably behind the United Kingdom. For example, well, she was very buoyed up by um, uh, gains for the women's movement in other, other parts of the world, particularly the United States. So please um, support me on PayPal, uh, georgecallahan79 at gmail.com, or indeed on Patreon, uh, book online lessons with me in any humanities subject, uh, and indeed French. Hire me as a tour guide in London. You can direct message me here. Okay, goodbye everybody.